Welcome back. Now, U.S. President Donald Trump has unveiled plans for a $54 billion increase in the defense budget, taking it to a record $603 billion at a time when the U.S. military is reducing its involvement in Afghanistan and Iraq. Trump said the increase was necessary, keeping in view national security and the need to rebuild what he described as a depleted military. He also hinted at a U.S. role in sorting out the quote-unquote mess in West Asia. The Middle East is far worse than it was 16, 17 years ago. There's not even a contest. So we've spent six trillion dollars. We have a hornet's nest. It's a mess like you've never seen before. We're nowhere. So we're going to straighten it out. This defense spending increase will be offset and paid for by finding greater savings and efficiencies across the federal government. We're going to do more with less. Now, the U.S. media reports quoted sources as saying that the hike would be used to build more ships and aircraft for the U.S. military. Early reports quoted Trump as saying that he wanted to increase the Army's strength from 480,000 men to 540,000, raise the number of ships and submarines to 350 from 276, and fighter aircraft to 1,200 from 1,100. There are also plans to boost the military's presence in the South China Sea and the Strait of Hormuz. We have to start winning wars again. I have to say, when I was young in high school and college, everybody used to say, we never lost a war. We never lost a war. You remember. Some of you are right there with me, and you remember, we never lost a war. America never lost. And now, we never win a war. We never win. And we don't fight to win. We don't fight to win. So we either got to win or don't fight it at all. Now, the hike in defense spending comes on the heels of the Pentagon submitting a plan for taking out the Islamic State. Media reports quoted sources as saying that the plan was political, military in nature, and aimed to counter the Islamic State beyond Syria and Iraq. It would also target Al-Qaeda. To discuss this, we're now joined in the studio by Ambassador Shashank, a former Foreign Secretary of India, and also Atul Singh, founder, CEO, and editor-in-chief of Fair Observer, and a keen commentator on India-U.S. relations. Welcome, gentlemen, to Gravitas. Thank you. I want to come to Ambassador Shashank. Uh, Ambassador Shashank, what do you make of this uh, $54 billion U.S. dollar increase, uh, a proposed increase in the U.S. defense budget? Uh, firstly, it will mean that money has to come from somewhere. Uh, there will be cuts on the domestic budgets. Uh, they're likely to be on the foreign aid programs. Uh, so one will have to see as to what is the total package. Absolutely. Uh, without that, perhaps it remains only in the uh, minds of the policy makers in the United States. So actually, till they actually translating them into action. So we need to see that they want to take on the Islamic State ideologically and militarily. Uh, how do they do that? I mean, they are the ones who created the Islamic State in many ways, and Al-Qaeda and all these various organizations, because they thought that they were helpful to them in countering what they called the evil empire. Indeed. Uh, now that the evil empire is being talked about by the Islamic State in a different context, and they want to set up their own caliphate, so what happens at that time? They are training their three-year-old, four-year-old children to cut off the heads of various uh, people whom they don't like. So what Mr. Trump is talking about, students of seventh or eighth grades who were always winning the wars. So is he going to capture the students of first and second grade and train them to deal with the Islamic State? One does not know. I mean, so there must be a lot of thinking going on in the American policy planners' minds. And I hope they come up with a good solution. And they also take into account the views of countries like India, where we have a lot of communities mm -hmm. living together in harmony. Uh, even where personality profiling has been done by several countries, they have said that, look, we try to identify Muslims in a slightly different way compared to others. But in India, we find that the Indian Muslims have a slightly different kind of a profile. So there is a little bit of confusion. 
we had seen recently case of an Indian engineer Indian who was killed India. by uh, a guy, uh, apparently a uh, racial attack, who said that he had gone and killed two Middle Eastern people. So he had no idea whether they were, they were Indians or Middle Eastern or from right. where, or Muslims or non-Muslims. So, yeah. so therefore, it's a very unscientific method in which the Americans are trying to go for profiling and then for the new system that they want to fight. It's a new war. They have not been able to win the wars over the last 30, 40 years. Everywhere they had to lose right. because they went there in order to block others from achieving True. anything. Now they must have a positive agenda. That is something very sure. important. They must make this positive agenda by finding partners in different parts of the world. Absolutely. Have they found those partners or are they only making deals? That Pakistan would say, okay, I will do something for you, but how much money will you give me? So they would give $12 billion, $14 billion. Pakistan would spend that money, so sorry. Fair we enough. could not handle your work. Indeed. So now we go to Chinese, we go to Saudis. They will give us some more money. Sure. Atul, uh, Ambassador Shashank mentioned or referred to the Islamic State. He also spoke about how America wants to win wars again. Now, before I come to the question for you, I want to quickly quote Trump when he said it yesterday, and I quote him, we have to win, we have to start winning wars again. I want to ask you, can you throw some numbers at me as to why Trump would propose a $54 billion uh, increase in defense budget? And what might be the implications for India and the world at large uh, if he indeed intends to target the Islamic State? Okay. Uh, let's look at the numbers sure. twofold. Right. One is, uh, you know, like the elephant's teeth. The tuskers are for sure. But then there are the teeth the elephant used for eating. So Obama, the Obama administration, had forecast a $35 billion increase. So when um, Trump talks about a $54 billion increase, it's not substantively higher. It's less than, actually, it's $19 billion more. Not a great deal. Remember also that um, the US has nearly 800 military bases in more than 70 countries and territories. Now, obviously, we have more than double the number of contributors, but they don't cost half as much as the bases. Right. Uh, we, we as in fair observer. Absolutely. Uh, and, and, and the rest uh, of the superpowers, the US, the the I mean, the UK, the Brits, the French, and the Russians have barely 30 foreign bases combined. So John McCain, who is a war veteran and was a prisoner in Vietnam, has recently said that our military is underfunded, undersized, and unready to confront threats to our national security. Mm -hmm. And I quote him. These are his very words. So what is going on? Well, if you look at U.S. military funding in 1976, it was $295 billion. This is as per the World Bank. A and uh, some figures are from the Stockholm um, International Peace Research Institute. Uh, so, but I won't get into which figure from where, but I'll tell you, 76, it was $295 billion. 1985, it rose up to $503 billion, uh, roughly. It was Fair a little enough, above yeah. these figures. 1988, in percentage terms, the U.S. GDP was 5.58% of the GDP. And in 2011, it slipped down to 4.8% of the GDP. 2015, it slipped down to 3.3% of the GDP. What does it mean in actual figures? Mm -hmm. Now, uh, Ramesh, uh, pardon me for just correcting you slightly. Uh, it's not a record budget. The record budget was probably 2011, or $711 billion. 2012, it slipped down to 685 billion. 2013, it slipped down further to 640 billion. 2014, 610 billion. 2015, 596 billion. 2016, arguably 604.5 billion. So what you're seeing is over a period of time, if you plot in absolute numbers, the trend is upward, though it has gone down after 2011 in absolute figures. In terms of percentage of the GDP, it has been downward since the end of the Cold War. Um, and it spiked up a bit during the Iraq <coughs> war and, of course, the Afghanistan war. Uh, but that slipped under the Obama administration because it had a very different view of international politics. Fair the enough. Obama view was soft power matters more than hard power. Military power is trumped by international consensus building. Therefore, the peace deal with Iran, therefore, the peace deal with Cuba. I think what we are seeing, to use Donald Trump's words, mm -hmm. is a reversion to a more hard power, more okay. militaristic standing. And no. he said, and I quote, nobody's going to mess with us, folks. Nobody. 
All right. Uh, and I think that's the underlying philosophy. Fair enough. Uh, coming to you, Ambassador Shashank, uh, President Trump has spoken of a quote unquote historic increase in military spending. And how does he propose to go about it? By uh, possibly reducing foreign aid. Now, how would that impact countries around the world, including some in our immediate neighborhood, especially Pakistan? Uh, Pakistan is a very difficult uh, client for the Americans because the Americans know that they have alternatives available to Pakistan. And they are in a very dangerous area uh, where they have been provoking the terrorists in the Pakistan and Af Pakistan, Afghanistan belt. And a situation has reached where they cannot control everyone. They try to control some of the groups, but not others. Uh, therefore, the Americans have to make peace with the Pakistanis. They have to keep funding them. So if they cut down some of the uh, foreign aid programs for mm -hmm. the farmers or for the uh, medicines and other kind of uh, social programs, they will have to give it in some other form. So therefore, one does not know whether Pakistan would be encouraged uh, to cooperate more with the Americans or not. So I think that remains an open question. Secondly, the Americans have to make a very clear thing as to how far can Pakistan go with the Chinese. Absolutely. Uh, on one hand, secondly, the Pakistanis have not been playing ball on Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. uh, the Haqqani network has been encouraged by them. Uh, of course, there are attacks, terrorist attacks within Pakistan also. Uh, but then they have been going in a very gung-ho fashion, uh, bombing all kinds of places in Afghanistan. And, and so they must uh, be told very clearly as to where the red lines are. Absolutely. Vis-a-vis -vis Afghanistan and on China. Sure. Atul, now, uh, if I can just quote uh, what uh, Trump said, he uh, wants to establish a more robust presence in key international waterways and choke points, such as the Strait of Hormuz and the South China Sea in particular. Now, referring to South China Sea, how would do you think it's going to impinge or impact upon US-China relations going forward, and where would India fit in in all of this? Would it, for instance, lead to a possible arms race in, in Asia, especially given Obama's so-called rebalance or pivot to Asia, which Trump for some reason is not as b bullish about, but still, would it, uh, how would it you know, impact relations inside and inside uh, Asia in particular? Okay, so let's uh, take a step back. I, sure. I wrote about the Asia pivot last year. It was quite a detailed article and we published Con Hallinan on how Trump could blunder into a war with China. Uh, so the risks are real, um, cons of Washington DC chap. Okay. Now, if you look at the Asia pivot policy, the underlying premise was the Middle East is a sideshow, the real threat is going to be China. So let's focus on it, otherwise sure. we might be toast. Sure. Um, and the Straits of Hormuz and the South China Sea are critical because if you notice, uh, the growth of Southeast Asia was because all these countries were US satellites from Thailand, to Philippines. Um, now, what Trump is doing at this period is doubling down militarily. Mm -hmm. He's saying we'll make sure that uh, we keep our military presence, we'll make sure that we keep the status quo. And the Chinese, who are dependent on energy from West Asia, are paranoid. Uh, they are absolutely paranoid of being choked off from energy, just as the right. Japanese were before the Second sure. World War. And so the Chinese really do not want that to be choked off. And mind you, uh, the arms race is a, is, is a big word because the Chinese military budget is 215 billion. Now it's big in, compared, in comparison to India. I was sitting with uh, friends in the defense ministry yesterday and they were giving me the budget we have for modernization. It's pathetic, it's chicken feet. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, compared to China, compared to the US, the Chinese, uh, uh, spending in basic research, in military hardware, in offshore capabilities is peanuts. So China is reasserting itself in what it deems to be its historic neighborhood. The US is fighting to preserve the status quo, but there is one thing that Trump has done that has upset the uh, apple cart. This mm -hmm. is a very different administration to something we've seen before. Okay. This is a break and a breach in post Second World War consensus. And I will quote none other than Steve Bannon, a chap you might have covered. And Steve Bannon said there are three pillars or three buckets around which this, is, this administration is organized. Number one, 
national security and sovereignty. Number two, economic nationalism. Number three, deconstruction of the administrative state. Right. All three can be seen in this move uh, in some ways. Now, national security, yes, and sovereignty, okay, we've controlled these waters, we will. But that clashes with the second pillar because the TPP has been thrown out. Right. The TPP was the big fundamental fulcrum for the Asia pivot for the Obama administration. True. Decades of work went into it. That is out of the window. So the, the hook for all the Southeast Asian Absolutely. allies is, or the glue has weakened, has been thinned out. Right. And, and that will make them wary of, of a clash because now they are economically very dependent on China. Absolutely. And, and, and the third thing, the deconstruction of the administrative state, which uh, our friend here has very eloquently alluded to, is that um, what that means is not just internally cutting down the EPA, cutting down the State Department, which, by the way, the Obama, uh, sorry, the, the Trump chaps have never liked also means cutting down on aid, some of which has already been cut down because they've taken a very hard line right. stance as to abortion, which means that a lot of organizations sure. that were getting funding for health care will be getting it. So the deconstruction of the administrative state means that aid to Southeast Asia, aid to Pakistan will inevitably come down because look at it, 2016 budget, US budget, 3.3 trillion were the revenues 3.9 trillion was the expenditure. Fair the enough. national debt cannot go on ballooning. And what you're seeing here is that this pressure on economics Fair and uh, the increase in military spending will lead to a flare up in Asia, right. both militarily and economically. Fair enough. Ambassador Shashank, now we've heard uh, Trump speak about America first and buy American and hire American. Contrast that with uh, Prime Minister Modi's make in India. <laughs> Do you see a strategic discordance there or a strategic dissonance there? And how do we bridge or overcome this, uh, this new phenomenon as it were? Uh, well, there are certain common elements also because India's uh, software industry is mostly connected with the United States. Right. Many of the people are working there on H-1B visas or they go on L-1 visa, etc. The other way is that the many venture capital firms are being set up by the Indian people, uh, not just the American passport holders, but in the, even the Indian passport holders. So therefore, on the Indian side, we see how do we get these people back to India to work here or to help create new right. companies. Uh, the kind of threats which are now being posed to the Indian community living in America or to other non-white communities uh, will definitely make a very large number of uh, people who can't make up their mind easily, so they might come back. Sure. So that will be one issue where both these things will be helped. It will not help the Trump thing, but the point is that uh, Trump has to think of some way whereby, firstly, they have to balance the budget. They have been balancing it by every year the Treasury Secretary has been going right. to China and requesting them not to cut down their purchases of the U.S. Treasury bonds. And the Chinese have said, all right, they would not withdraw the previous ones, but the new ones will depend mm -hmm. as to how much they put. On South China Sea, as we talked a little while ago, the Trump administration wanted to write a new deal and say, well, one China policy is to be reviewed. Then till the Chinese told them that, look, this was signed by the Republican administration in 1972. Right. So how do they go about it? I mean, then they, everything is off. So, so I do not know. I mean, they, they, it's one thing to make a policy announcement, but one needs to see how these policies have to be implemented. Uh, India is a, supposed to be a partner country to fight terrorism and also on the Asian uh, geopolitical scenario. Fair enough. But have any discussions taken place? With India only our national security advisor had gone there. <coughs> Foreign Secretary has just now gone, but one sees uh, limited agenda right. being given to them for discussions. Fair enough. Uh, on that note, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Ambassador Shashank, Atul, thank you so much for your inputs. Uh, moving on, now the big story about North Korea. It's a classic whodunit that is still unraveling the killing of North Korean leader's brother Kim Jong-nam by one of the deadliest chemical weapons created by man. 
Two women have been arrested so far, but clearly there was no motivation for these women to eliminate him. So who is the brain behind this brazen assassination? Meanwhile, UK-based Telegraph newspaper has said that two suspected North Koreans are probably hiding in the Pyongyang embassy in Malaysia. For those of you who are new to this story, here is what happened in the Malaysian airport. You can see both the Kim Jong-nam at the circle on the left and the lady in the circle on the right. In the area circle here, you can see the lady covering the face of Nam, surprising him. Nam is seen talking about the incident to the security forces. He's seen here walking with a wobble, obviously in a bit of delirium. Here he is seen going into the medical room where he's supposed to have collapsed and died. The big question on everyone's mind, though, is did the North Korean leader Kim Jong-un order the assassination of his estranged half-brother? We have Jason Yeo, journalist of the Korea Herald, speaking to us on the possibility. Uh, Jason, why would the North Korean leader order an assassination of this kind? What's the evidence so far? Um, all right. One of the uh, primary reasons for Kim Jong-nam being assassinated by you know, apparently two, maybe does maybe more than like eight uh, assassin from multinational uh, country is that uh, he is considered to be a real threat to the Kim Jong Un regime, who is the leader of North leader of North Korea. And uh, like uh, after Kim Jong Nam uh, was uh, fallen out of favor of out of the race to you know become the leader of uh become, become the leader of um north korea uh he has been living in exile and he has been criticizing the north korea uh a lot of times so it uh makes kim jong-un who is the current leader of north korea think that he's kind of like posing a real threat and to make the matter worse uh kim jong-nam uh has long been considered to be uh, replacement of Kim Jong Un uh, by the ch Chinese government, uh, even though uh, there is a there is a disputing evidence about that. So, um, just uh, yeah, in conclusion, um, Kim Jong Un has been a threat to the Kim Jong Un regime. So the dictator uh, might have ordered, um, you know, taking out him, taking out him. Jason, what does the North Korean leader gain from uh, such operations? Does it enhance his position at home? Um, yep, yeah, uh, it will enhance his position at home because obviously uh, Kim Jong Un is a very young dictator, and um, his uh, you know his grip on power is not as strong as his uh, father and his grandfather. So um, he wants to make sure that everyone would obey his, you know, like, you know, ironclad rule on his people. And according to the reports and according recently, there is a lot of, you know, uh, not a lot of, but there are some high profile defection from North Korea. Uh, recently, there was, a, you know, number two uh, top diplomat, uh, North Korean you know, um, diplomat in London um, was defected to South Korea recently, and he also criticized the regime. So I think Kim Jong-un might be afraid of, you know, those kind of defectors are, you know, like criticizing him. So, um, yeah, it obviously uh, enhances his position at home. Right. The North Koreans have done kidnappings and assassinations on foreign soil before. What does this tell us of their intelligence uh, capabilities, Jason? Um, yeah, they have done a lot of, you know, kidnappings and, um, you know, terrorism attack against uh, foreigners, including South Koreans. Um, as far as I remember, there was a uh, like cousin of, you know, the ruling Kim family was attacked in the late uh, early, you know, 20s and uh, yeah, so um, he was kind of like assassinated on a broad daylight uh, by, you know, uh, assassin presumably hired by the North Korean, you know, agents. So, um, yeah, there was, um, you know, you know, cases uh, for North Korea to 
take out its uh, defector living in South Korea and other countries, so it is not uh, a new one. And I think they have a very you know powerful intelligence capability to um, find out um, you know hunt down you know defectors, North their own defectors are uh, living abroad because uh, they have dispatched. Uh, their own spies and agents to you know take out those peoples and some of them have you know like um, you know um, try to assassinate a lot of you know like defectors but they ultimately failed to do it and they got you know arrested by the South Korean authorities and then they told the police that there was some kind of like plus and you know, um, intelligence bureau uh, conducting this kind of this kind of operation against those people. So I think they have, you know, incredible intelligence capability. But do you think the North Koreans are being helped by the Chinese, for instance? Would the Chinese be in interested in encouraging such activities, Jason? I don't think Chinese uh, has encouraged such kind of activities because. Um, uh, obviously, North Korea and China is very close, and they have fought together during the Korean War. But uh, the ties have been weakened recently after you know North Korea conducted nuclear tests and missile tests. So this make uh, this made China very nervous about North Korea's erratic behavior. So the ties are not as strong as um, you know the past so i don't think the chinese have ever encouraged the north to do such kind of you know like horrible thing all right on that note we leave it at that uh, thank you jason you're a senior journalist with the korea herald newspaper time for a short break more news on the other side stay tuned to gravitas Welcome back. Now, it was a day when Srinivas Kuchipotla was laid to rest after he was killed in what appears to be a hate crime in Kansas last week. But could he have been saved? The answer is unconvincing. Police dispatches from the Olaith Power indicate that medical help to the victim was delayed. Audio tapes aired by the Kansas City Star newspaper show an officer relaying the message that a white male had shot the victim inside the bar. The officer can then be heard saying that medical aid had not yet been provided. 32-year-old Kuchi Botla, an engineer at Garmin Limited, was killed in the attack. His friend Alok Madasani and another customer at the bar, Ian Grillet, were hurt. All right, for more on this uh, story, we're now joined by Anjana Singh, the media spokesperson for the India Association of Kansas City. Anjana, thanks for uh, speaking to us on Gravitas. Uh, I want to begin by asking you, is it true that uh, medical help was probably delayed uh, to the victim? Is that uh, your so. sense as well? No, I don't think so. See, any, any incident like this happens in your community, the first thing is uh, making, the, making the area safe and secure for others. There was a church in front of Austin Bar. So priority was to make sure that every... Because if something like this happens, even... Authorities don't know what exactly happened, who shot where. A lot many people were assuming that somebody fired the shot at church. So even parents were confused. So this whole area was blocked for more than one and a half hour. I, I, I don't think that the services was delayed because mm -hmm. Ian and Alok were saved. Unfortunately, Srinivasan lost his life in this incident. But believe me, uh, I, I'm, I'm not convinced that the services were delayed. Indeed. Uh, also, Anjana, his killing has shocked India, no doubt. But what's the predominant feeling or sentiment in Kansas? Uh, may I have your name, please? Uh, my name is Ramesh. Ramesh, uh, see, anything happens 
near your home front, where you live, where you stay, everybody should be scared. Because if you consider your area to be the safest place and something like this happens, you are definitely scared. So it's not that Indian community is scared. Every other community living in this place is scared. Because something like this, they never imagined that this will happen in Kansas or Olathe or Oberlin Park. So um, when IAKC uh, organized our IAKC and other local communities organized this peace walk, the intention was to give a message to the mass that there is nothing to be scared of. We are one team. We all are trying to support each other, live in a safe environment. So I strongly believe that one person's sick thoughts cannot change the fact that this is a safe place. Uh, also, Anjana, the FBI, we are given to understand, is treating this case as a possible hate crime. Now, do you see at all a correlation between uh, hate crimes or racist attacks targeting Muslims or immigrants uh, generally and the installation of the Trump administration in Washington? Uh, see, this is still under investigation, so I, I don't think I should pass my judgment on this thing. Um, regarding to Trump government, do you remember a few years back when Jewish community was targeted in Obama's government? So I don't think any incident like this where a person decides to just shoot someone is not related with any authority or any political influence. It's just that a sick mind do things that is not good to humanity. Indeed, also has the Indian community in general or the India Association of Kansas City in particular condemned the attack, the killing of Srinivas and uh, what are your expectations uh, from the Trump administration? As far as Trump administrations, we, we do not have any expectations. We just expect this place to be safe again. We just want our community to feel safe again. So the Congress Yoder, when Kevin Yoder came on the vigil service that we organized, when he <clears> said <throat> that Indian community is a vibrant part of Kansas City, and that I would definitely repeat his line that Kevin Yoder said, attack on one of us is attack on all of us. That was a strong message that congressmen tried to communicate with the mass that this is, this is not accepted. And... Believe me, all of the people that came into visual services, they were all shocked. Most of the Americans tried to hug us. They were trying to pass this <clears throat> comment that we are really sorry that this unfortunate incident happened in our community, our locality. So as a representative Indian community, I would definitely try to say that we all are trying to move on with this thing and trying to maintain the peace and calm. and. Just hope that everything will be normal for us. All right. On that note, Anjana, I want to thank you for sharing your thoughts with us on Gravitas tonight. That was Anjana Singh, the spokesperson of the India Association of Kansas City. Well, that is a wrap on this edition of Gravitas. But news continues here on Beyond. You can catch all the latest updates on our social media, mobile and digital platforms. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.